Okay, welcome to part one of the Tiny Room Simulator. It's going to be a very basic introduction to just creating a little room where you can place objects inside. It's a really nice exercise to kind of introduce you to the different aspects of uh, Unity and coding. Uh, I'm going to be doing two different series on this. The one is going to be using visual scripting and the other one's going to be using C Sharp. This is going to be the a visual scripting one and then I'm going to have an entire different one for C Sharp doing the exact same thing. So let's get started. I have these models that I downloaded from Kenny.nl, a really nice uh, guy with a really nice website that has a lot of assets that you can get, 2D, 3D, he's got animations, music, all sorts of things. So I'll share the link with you in the description below. But let's get started. So I'm going to go to this little room that I quickly modeled in Blender. I'm just going to drag it in. So that's what the room looks like. Very basic. It's just got a floor and three walls. I've just assigned random colors to them so at later stage I can change the materials, that sort of thing. I realized in Blender I modeled it in the wrong direction, so I'm going to be rotating my room negative 90 in the Y, just so that it's facing the right way. And because I've done this a few times, I'm going to just set up the camera to be orthographic. So I'm just going to set up the position and I know exactly where it is in the world. So I'm going to do negative 4.8 in the X, 4.8 in the Y, and negative 4.8 in the in the Z. And then the rotation is going to be 30 degrees in the X and 45 degrees in the Y. So if we go to the game view, you'll see that it's looking the way it's supposed to. We're looking down on this little room so we can start simulating things. I don't want to see the skybox in this case, so I'm going to disable the skybox on the right side here under the camera component, make it a solid color, just for the time being, I'm just going to change it to any other color that isn't that Unity Blue. And at this point, you can decide if you want to kind of leave it as perspective or if you want to kind of make it orthographic. So for this exercise, I'm just going to make my camera orthographic. And I'm also just going to zoom it in a little bit. So it kind of feels like a little bit like Monument Valley kind of situation. So that's what it looks like now. So our scene is set up, and just out of good practice, when you're in the game view, just change it from free aspect to the correct aspect ratio. In this case, I do a lot of work on 16 by 9, so I'm going to make this for a monitor or a resolution of 16 by 9. Okay, we're almost done with like prepping the scene, so the camera is set up. You can see the shadows look really janky and really weird. We'll fix that up. It's uh, it's just the resolution of the shadows. You can see in the viewport it looks good, but inside the game view it doesn't. So we're going to fix that at a later stage. Right now I'm just more concerned about the code. So I'm going to save at this point in case anything should happen. If you're wondering, Unity by default has a sample scene. So when I hit save, it didn't ask me where to save it. It just automatically saved it to this sample scene. So I just want to rename that. I'm going to right click, rename, let's just call this Tiny Room Simulator. There we go. I'm going to hit reload so that it, after it's renamed, you can reload the scene. Okay, we're good to go now. So let's add um, the idea for this uh, this video is we're going to set up a little button that when I click on the button, I'm able to drop an object into the scene and then it'll follow my cursor around in the floor. That's going to be the first video. As we progress, we're going to add more complexity, but I just want to introduce the concept of input through the button and then ray casting to find where in the world we can place it and then let, uh, uh, taking a input from the mouse to drop the object into the scene. So by no stretch of the imagination is this going to be perfect, but it is going to be a great starting point for the rest of the series. Let's do it. So I'm going to go and go to Game Object at the top here, go UI, and let's add a standard button. <clears throat> I'm going to split the screen just to kind of show you something. Can the canvas by default, notice how I can't see my button anymore in the game view, but if as I make it bigger, the button comes in and out. The last thing you want to do when you're designing a game is your button disappears based on the screen size or potential resolution difference that are from the different devices you're building for. So we want to make sure that we can get this button to be in this view at all times. So as a, if you're a beginner and the starting point, the, the easiest thing to do is go to your canvas, go to your canvas scaler, and just change it from constant pixel size here to scale with screen size. The moment you do that, you'll see the button has shifted. So I'm going to now reposition the button where I want it to be. I'm not quite sure where I think I'm going to put it. I'm just going to put it maybe to the top right here somewhere. There we go. Okay, so the button's in place, but I need just 
out of habit, I, I like to rename my things for filing purposes. So I'm going to right click and rename this button to button dash. And this is going to be a bed. So I'm going to say bed. Just so that I know this is the button that when I click on it, I'm going to instantiate a bed into this level. And you'll see that it says button on the text. So I just want to go and expand the button game object. Go into there and find the text game object. And you'll see it says button on the right here. I'm going to call this one bed. And I'm also just going to scale the font up a little bit. Remember, do not scale UI elements. You'll get a lot of pixelation. You want to use the, the required rec transform, or in this case, the font size to make it bigger. So I'm going to make it bigger, and I'm just going to change the font style from normal to bold italic, just so that it's more legible. And that's it. We're not going to go into too much complexity here. This is that's a different exercise altogether. So I'm going to save again. Just and now we can test it. So if I go and make this bigger or smaller, notice how the button, the button is now locked in place. If you want to take it one step further, you can uh, assign the anchor point to this button. Now think of the anchor point as a pivot. You can anchor it to the top right, top middle, top left, and so on and so forth around the, your actual canvas. So the button is in the top right. So I'm going to click in the inspector where it says middle and center, and I'm going to choose top right over there just so that you see that how the anchor point is moved up there if I zoom out and change the anchor point a few times just for you to see we just put this over here so we can see it better it's at the top right over there I'm also going to disable the skybox so it's just easier to see and I'm going to go and change the anchor point around a few times notice how it shifts around so when the canvas scales in size and reduces it uses that anchor point and tries to stay the distance it is from that anchor point at all times I'm just going to bring it back to top right. Oh, it's not even top right. There we go. And now we're good to go. So we've primed our scene and we're ready to do the actual coding side of it. But at this point, because we're doing two video tutorials, I'm just going to save a new version of the scene. I'm just going to call this one Tiny Room Simulator. And at the end, I'm just going to say C Sharp, just so that I have two versions. That way I can do it the same thing twice to both scenes. Okay, now we're good. To, we're ready to go. So let's do it. I'm going to do three pieces of code in this exercise. One is going to be on the button so that I can store a reference to the prefab that I want to use in my to generate. I'm going to have one foot to that manages the game itself. And then the third one is going to be that actually can give functionality to the object you're bringing on, like turning on the light or a TV or turning on a tap, that kind of thing. You can do a lot of different functionality with that. So disclaimer, not all of these things are the best way to do it, but I have found that this is the best way to learn the concepts of what we're doing at the basic core level. So I'm, I've simplified this a lot just for ease of use and just to kind of understand things. Okay, so for those of you who haven't used Bolt before, I just went to Assets, Import Package and Custom, and I just uh, after purchasing and downloading the package, I have installed it. You'll see there's a Ludic folder at the bottom left here in the project. And at the top, there is a tools folder. Sorry, a to tools menu. So you can see that you've got Ludic installed. Let's add a piece of code. So I'm going to grab my button. And at the bottom right of my inspector, I'm going to add a flow machine. And when you add a flow machine, you'll see that it adds a component variables. And another component flow machine so flow machine isn't a script by itself it's just a container for a script so you're going to create a script and this flow machine is going to be able to convert the script that you're doing into a visual format that we can read and move nodes around so currently you can't click on the edit graph button because we don't have a script so let's click new and i'm going to i always like to manage my files so i'm going to right click new script folder so i'm going to type in script I'm going to double click on that folder and we're just going to call this one UI button. There we go. You'll see that if I go to the scripts folder, there is my script. And now you can hit the edit graph button. When you do and you've got a new window, you can dock this anywhere you want by simply holding, hovering over the tab where it says flow graph. I'm just going to put mine down at the bottom here. Now, just like C sharp, if you look at the bolt, when you generate it, it generates a start and an update function. So that is good to go. That is exactly what it's supposed to do. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're going to start by deleting these two because we don't need them. We just need to 
listen for input from this button. When this button gets pressed, we're going to do something. Okay, so I'm going to maximize this view so I can work in this view while we're coding. Now, how you do maximize any view inside of Unity is just have your cursor over that view, go Shift Spacebar, and you'll notice you can maximize that view. And we're going to do the same thing with the flow graph. When I maximize the flow graph, notice how we have an extra little panel on the left here, which has uh, access to the different types of locations we can save our variables. So we can save our variable in the graph. As it says here, these variables are local to the current graph. I'm just going to do the first three and then you can read through those on your own object. These variables are shared across the current game object. So you could have three or four different scripts or flow machines on the same object. And if you want those, all of those to have access to a variable, you just put it in the object variable. Scene is simple enough. You, these variables are shared across the current scene. So if there's a variable you would like every object in the scene that has code on it to be able to access, you're going to put it in the scene. Okay, so I'm going to start by creating a object variable that I want to use in here. So first things first, I'm going to call this one main button because I want to, oh, let me rename that. Holy crap, that was bad. And I want to have reference to the button that we're going to be listening for. So I'm going to just click on null and Bolt by default has the standard kind of uh, variables that uh, that you can see down here, but you can also search the top here and we'll search for button it should be the first result. And now we don't have reference to the button. And as most of you have realized, you can probably just, I'm going to click on the circle here to show you the first way we can assign it. You can assign the button from the scenes. We called it button bed. That's the one way. The other way is to minimize the view again. And you'll see now that you have the variable over here on the right here. I need to just make sure it says button again, sorry. It is uh, a, a little bug in Bolt itself. And you can just simply drag the button from the inspect, uh, from the hierarchy into the inspector onto that variable and you, uh, that's been assigned. So you pretty much have those ways of assigning it. So it's up to you how you want to go about doing it. The second variable, we're going to call this, um, let's just call it prefab to spawn, because this variable is going to hold the prefab that I want to instantiate into the scene. So this is going to be a game object, which is straight in the middle over here. And we don't currently have one, so I'm just going to click on the circle and go to my assets and just randomly select one. So I'm just going to search. I just want to show you the problems with these assets. So my room is a different scale to the assets that I import. So we've got to kind of adjust that. Okay, now that we have that, let's test to see what we can do. So I'm going to, if you just left click on this little equals next to the variable and drag it into the flow graph, you're going to do a get a get variable. What that means is I'm getting information from this variable. I have the main button. And what do I want to do is I want to listen for input. So I'm going to just drag from here. I'm going to type in on button click. You could have also just typed click, but on button click. Now, the thing about Bolt is if you see a green node, it means green for go. So without a green node in your Bolt, it, nothing is going to fire. This is the starting point for where most of your code. So you need at least one green node in your uh, code in order for the, something to be called and for the rest that's connected to it to be fired. So all we're doing in these two nodes here is let's put a little group. Oops, let me delete that. Let's try that again. Oh, Jesus. Let's just make it, let me delete so I can show you how I actually did that. If you hold down, down control and left click and drag, you can create a little group around section. So you can just kind of almost like commenting code, you can just allow yourself to see kind of what does what. So this one is, uh, let's just say waiting for UI. Input. That's all that that does. We're waiting for UI input. If you notice, if you're in the maximize view, you can on the left here you can change the color of your little group. Here we go. So that's what we all we're doing there is we're listening for input. Okay. So once the button gets pressed, what are we going to do? We're going to drag across. We're going to develop this code as we go throughout the series. I'm doing the very bare bones right now just to get something happening. We're going to instantiate. So we're going to type in game object dot instantiate and we're just going to go game object dot instantiate original that's all we need here 
What this does for people who play games, this is a spawner. We are instantiating or spawning an object into the scene. What is the object? Over here it says original. That is the object it actually wants to instantiate. What is that object? If you look on the left side here, we actually created a prefab to spawn variable. Left click and drag that in. And that is the actual object we want to instantiate into the world. So we're going to left click and drag from the right side. All these little dots on either side of your nodes are your, think of these as incoming and think of those as outgoing. So whenever you see a node on the left side, like we do over here with instantiate, it needs an input. It needs something to go into it. The, out, the right side is where you can feed that in, the, what's inside of this node out to something else. Now, before we continue, if you see a node red, it means it's broken. If you see this kind of node that is orange like it is here, that means it's missing information. It's warning us beforehand that we it needs something or it's not going to work. In this case, it doesn't have an object to instantiate. That's where this variable comes in. So we're just going to connect those two together. And we can actually test this as it is, and you'll see the problem straight away. So I'm going to just start the game. I'm also going to just zoom out on them. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Note, keep an eye on the code when we're playing. Nothing is happening. There's no activity in the code at the bottom here. Now click the button. The code fired through all the way. It instantiated this bed. Look how big the bed is. So the scale's a problem. So I'm just going to go into my scene view and go to where my room is. And notice how big this bed is. So we need to rectify the problem. So these assets are free and they're really, really nice assets, but the origins in some of them are in a weird place, so the pivots. So I don't want the pivot to be in the bottom left corner here. I would like it to be somewhere in the center of the room. So we need to rectify this. So now we are instantiating and that's great, but uh, I need to kind of take what we have and work, uh, just fix it so that it works correctly. So I'm gonna go to our assets in the models folder. I'm gonna grab the double bed that I've got here. I'm gonna drag it into my hierarchy. And because I've done this a few times, I know it's about 10 times too big. So I'm going to make uh, the scale exact. I'm going to go 0.1 in the X, 0.1 in the Y, and 0.1 in the Z. If we zoom in now, it's now about the right scale. Okay, so but the origin is still in the wrong point. And I'm not going to go and take this into Blender and fix the origin and bring it back. So I'm going to do a fix in Unity itself. The way I'm going to do that is go to Game Object. Create a new empty object. Make sure the empty object is at 0, 0, 0. So I'm just going to right click on the transform and reset it. Notice how it's kind of in the middle of the room. I'm going to right click and rename this. I'm going to copy this one and just use this as the renaming. I'm going to call this bed double base because I'm going to use this as the parent of the actual model. So when I'm done, I'm going to drag the model into the parent. <clears throat> that way, when I move it, it's at that corner, but now I need to just reposition the model itself to be in the correct place. So I'm going to kind of eyeball this. I wouldn't recommend it, but this is just an exercise, so I'm going to just eyeball it really quick. So what I'm going to do is click on this little green arrow at the top here. I'm going to click in the queue in the middle just to go into orthographic uh, view from the top so that I can just simply move my bed somewhere in the middle. Again, I'm just eyeballing this. I would recommend that the models you use probably should be rectified in your 3D application before bringing it into Unity. Okay, now once this is done, I'm just going to click again just to kind of see. Okay, the middle, the center point's a little bit off. It's kind of up here. So I'm just going to just reposition it a little bit. That's okay. That'll do. Now to get back out of this orthographic view, I'm just going to click on the little cube in the top right again in the middle just to go back to my perspective view. Okay, now we're good. Now I need to I need to actually make a prefab of this object so I can reuse it again back in the level. So in my assets down here, I'm going to right click, create a new folder, let's call it prefabs, and double click on the prefabs. And I'm just going to, this is the easiest thing you'll ever do in Unity is create a prefab. I'm going to grab the bed, uh, the bed double base from the hierarchy and drag it into that new folder that I created. Notice how this has now become blue. It's no longer like the others where it's this kind of outlined little gray cube. It's become a blue cube. It's informing us that there is a reference to this belong. This exists somewhere else other than the scene. So if I click on it, and if you never, if you forget where it is, so let's say I forgot where the model is, but I know it's a uh, prefab. All I need to do is select it, go to the top right here, 
and click select and it shows me where the original version of this file is. And that goes the same thing for the isometric room at the top here. It'll just show me where it was, uh, where it is in the project. Now that I got this, I can delete it on my project. And now we need to switch out to the, sorry, wrong place. We need to switch out the object we're instantiating with this new one. So we're going to go back to our flow graph and I'm going to maximize this view again. And let's go to the objects. And over here where we have the prefab to spawn, it's currently, it's still using the bed double. So I'm going to click over there. And I'm going to select this one, which says bed double base. That is the one that I want. And then we can test it one more time to see at least if the bed spawns in the middle of the room and it is the correct scale. So I'm going to click the button. There we go. So that is great. We are on the right track. We're now using the correct model. We've scaled it down. And now we're going to go. And when I move my cursor around, I would like the bed to follow my cursor as if it's attached to the cursor. So we're going to do that next. We need to start by um, working with layers. So think of layers as a, groups, and you can put s different items in different groups and make them behave differently or have different behavior done on different groups. So in this case, case I'm going as we progress through this project, I'm going to add a layer to the floor, add a layer to the wall, so that I know that a bed should only be able to go on the floor, a painting can go on the wall, but it shouldn't go on the floor, that kind of thing. So we're just going to develop this. But for now, all I need is a layer for the floor because that's where the bed is going to go. So I'm going to select floor in my asymmetric room on the left here. I'm going to go to the top here and I'm going to create a new layer. At the top here, go to layer default, go add layer. And you, the first available layer for us to use is layer eight. So I'm just going to type floor. And by doing this, you've created the layer, but you haven't actually assigned the layer to the floor. So we need to select the floor again. Go to the top here, go to default and select floor. Now this floor has a layer of itself. Remember when working with ray casting, you, are, you do need to have a collider on the object because ray casting needs to actually hit something. So a, as, we, if you've, as we've spoken before, colliders are just ways to inform other objects that this object takes up space. It actually has a way to... Um, so that if you want to use physics, it's not going to fall through the floor or move through the wall. So let's continue with the ray casting. We've now done the floor collider. We're good to go. I always save ever so often in case something happens or my file crashes. So we're going to move on to the next script. And for this, I need to create a game object at the top, empty. I need to just create an empty and I always like to reset my models to zero zero, especially if I'm not going to be using it as an actual model. This is going to be a placeholder for my game manager. So I'm going to right click on that game object, rename it, and let's just call it tiny room manager. So this is going to be the script that holds the majority of the logic. So this is going to be my little tiny room manager. And we're going to add a new flow machine to that. And now you'll see again, edit graph is uh, grayed out. You can't use it because we haven't created a script yet. So we need to go new script. I'm going to call this tiny room manager. There we go again. By default, it creates a start and an update. <clears throat> so let's delete the start. And something I forgot to mention earlier on, but you probably have realized the way you navigate this viewport down here is the same way you navigate the, the actual game viewport. Middle mouse button allows you to pan around and the wheel mouse zooms in and out, but it's limited to a certain extent. There's, uh, it's, it's clamped. But notice how if I have my cursor over here and I zoom in, it zooms into where the cursor is. So if I want to zoom in back to this node, I just put my cursor over it and zoom into that. So that's really helpful and really useful. So keep that in mind. I'm just going to be using the update in this case, but I'm not just ready to use, I'm not ready to use this just yet. I need to go do one more thing in my button. So I'm going to go back to my button and maximize the view so you can see it properly. We need to do something to check to see. We're going to need to tell it, okay, cool. I've now generated this object. I need to actually make a copy of this, uh, store this into a variable and then tell the ray cost that it can start ray costing in the world because I'm now currently placing that object. So I'm going to do this. We're going to do this in the actual scenes. This is uh, two variables I want to be able to access by any script in the scene. So I'm going to put that variable in the scenes here. I'm going to click here 
and I'm just going to call this uh, placing because that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be asking if we're currently placing an object or not. So I created a variable called placing. That is going to be a boolean. And by default, I want it to be false. We are not placing when we start the game. We are only placing when we actually click a button to start the placing. So that's going to be false by default. And the next one is going to be current spawned prefab. So I need to have a reference to the currently spawned prefab as a variable. So what's nice is you don't necessarily have to set this right now because we're going to set that here. So I'm going to leave it as a null. That one needs to be a bool because I'm not setting that and I'm not going to be changing what that is later on. I need to know what that is from the beginning. And the way we set this variable is if you left click and drag, you get a get. But if you hold down alt and left click and drag, you get a set variable. Notice the difference. The one that says get, the other one says set. The one has uh, input pins on the left and the right, and it also has execution pins on either side over there. So that's how you know if you've done it right. So now that we have the set, we're just going to connect these all up together so that they actually, when the, the logic goes through, it fires this off, instantiates, and then we can set this variable over here. Again, do you see how it's orange, which means it's not completed. It's missing an input. And that is this node over here. It needs to know what it, this variable is going to be. When we already have it here where we instantiate. So we're going to drag from the instantiate and plug it into here so that we're telling it, by the way, you are now this object. Once we've done that, we can just simply hold down Alt, drag the bool into here, placing. And again, it's orange, so we need to left click and drag from the green dot on the left side of this variable, we're just going to add a bool literal. And we're just going to set that to true because now we are currently placing. Okay, for now this is going to be all we're doing in this button. So we're just going to move it across, hold down control and left drag. I'm just going to call this um, spawn prefab in the level. There we go, that's what it's doing. It's spawning the prefab in the level. Just gonna give it a random color over here. And what's nice about adding groups is you can move the group and it moves everything in the group together. So this one is waiting for input. This one actually instantiates the prefab in the level. We are now done with the button for this uh, lesson. Let's move down to our tiny room and now we're good to go. So we're ready to work. So I'm going to again maximize this because we're gonna use it. So first thing we're gonna do is do our uh, what we call an if statement. In Bolt, it's called a branch. So we're going to drag off the update. We're going to go branch. And it has one input and two outputs. If this is true, then do the following. If this is false, you do the, 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 the latter. So let's talk about going to our scene. Remember that placing ball we created? We're going to drag that in. And we're going to plug that into the left side of that branch. So all we're asking here is, if placing is true, then go true. If placing would like it is now currently false, then we're going to go into the false. So for this exercise, I don't care. If it's false, we're going to do nothing. All I care about is if it is true. That's all I care about. <clears throat> so once this is true, I need to do one more check. So we're just going to grab this bar, select this branch, go copy, paste, control C, control V. And then I need to do one more check just to make sure of if we're actually hitting something with the rate cost. So let's look at this. We're going to go through here. We're going to go here. And then we're going to check to see if, and this is where we're going to do our rate cost. Right click. And we're going to first, we need to know where the camera is so we can rate cost in the direction of the camera. So we're going to go camera dot main get this is going to be our camera and we're going to be okay now that we know the camera where it is we also know the direction it needs to go all we need to do is find where because let me just kind of demo this over here so if my cursor is over here i want to find the cursor and raycast into the world so over here it will hit nothing over there it'll hit a wall hit a wall and over here it'll hit the floor so i just want to find where the cursor is take the camera direction like we have in this node here and raycast in that direction. So let's do that. I'm going to drag from here and I'm going to type in screen to ray. 
we're looking for camera dot screen to ray screen point to ray position okay so you'll see that okay cool we've got the camera to look from now we need to know where to ray cost from where the starting position is if you will we're going to drag from that and we're going to type in mouse position and we're looking for input dot mouse position get Okay, so now we have exactly where the ray cost should be coming from and the direction it should be going in. Now we can actually do the actual ray cost itself. We're going to drag from here because what's really nice about Bolt is it's kind of, it's smart. So if I drag from here, I'm going to type in ray cost. And then you can see over here. So we need physics.raycost and we need the following. We need ray, hit info, max distance, and layer mask. I'll to explain to you why we need all of those. First of all, we need to know, I'm going to plug this in right now. So I'm going to, this is telling us whether it hits something true or false. We're going to do that. It's true. We've hit something. We're good to go. The next one is, this gives me information about the object that I hit. The normal the position, we could even get the object name, that kind of stuff. So this has information that I need to be able to get the position of where the ray cost is so we can move our bed around the thing correctly. Now, you'll notice that there are two more inputs that are required on the left side here. The first one is how far the ray cost will go into the world before it stops. So I'm just going to put something like, this is going to be excessive, but let's make it like 100 meters or 100 units into the world. And the layer mask, we already have that. So I'm going to drag from the layer mask and I'm going to type in layer mask dot literal. There we go. Uh, at, uh, as we progress forward, we're going to actually create a variable for this layer mask. But right now, we know we're just testing this out. So where it says nothing, I'm going to click on it. I'm going to choose floor. So I'm going to be ray casting for the floor. If I hit the floor, that's true. And if that happens, we can move for further forward, and we're now going to grab the current spawned prefab, and we're going to move that object around. So now that we have a reference to the current prefab that we've spawned, we're going to drag out, and we're going to type in transform dot position because we want to move the position. But this time, do not don't make the mistake of get, doing the get. We need to get the set because we want to set this object position based on the result from the ray cost. Just neaten this up a little bit. There we go. Again, notice how it's orange, which means it needs an input. You'll see there's an empty pin on the side here. Right now, if I ray cost, it's only going to set it to 0, 0, 0, where it's currently being instantiated anyway. So we need to get the correct position based on where the ray cost hit. So we're going to type a drag out of here. We're going to search for ray cost hit dot point so ray cost hit dot point and we're going to get that what that means is the ray cost hits in the world and it finds a location where it hit and it brings me it returns a vector three and if you look at the icon on the, the ray cost hit point and if you look at the icon on the transformed opposition they match so we just need to plug those two in together and we are good to go just going to add a group around this just to keep things nice and neat. Left, con uh, hold down control and left mouse button, and let's just say move spawned object in the level. There we go. Move spawned object in the level. Okay, so let's test this out. Uh, you'll see the code. It's very it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to just kind of sit here and look while you're playing, just look at Bolt to see the code firing. That's the really nice thing about a visual scripting language. It's just, um, it's very visual, I guess. So if we zoom in here, notice how the update is locked into this branch. So because this is false, it can't go past this branch. But the moment I click this button, notice how it's now at the second branch because the ray cost isn't anything because my cursor is currently over the button. But the moment I move my cursor over the floor, notice how it's now firing all the way through and I can move my object around the floor. But the moment my ray cast stops, my bed's not going to keep following because there's no longer somewhere that the bed could be moving to. There we go.
Okay, so it's still going through walls. It's still not, uh, it's still very early days, but you're able to move this around. And what I want to do next is if I left click again, I want to be able to drop this bed somewhere in the wall. Right now, it just keeps following forever. So let's fix that. What we're going to do here is we're going to right click. We're going to search for on mouse input, I think it is. There we go, on mouse input. It's also a green node. Notice firing comes from green events. So we're going to choose the left mouse button and when the button is down. So this is going to be listening for your left mouse button. So when you click, it's going to fire this off and it's going to do something. Again, for, for the all intents and purposes, this is a very basic exercise. We're going to expand on it. So I'm going to do very basic everything. We're going to revisit a lot of these pieces of code as we advance and refine the system some more. So over here, when I click the left mouse button, all I want to basically do <clears throat> sorry, is drop the object. But first I want to double check, so I'm going to drag and add a branch. First to see if we are actually placing. So I want to go into here and I want to drag, might as well just grab the placing from up here, put it down here, and plug it in. So when I left mouse click, if we're currently placing, so if it's true, I'm going to hold down Alt and left click and drag this in. I'm going to drag again from the left side and make it a bull. I want to set it to false. So the reason we're doing is we're just putting a little fail, fail safe. We're obviously going to do this again, but I don't want to just left click and turn this to false randomly. I just want to know, am I currently placing? If so, then set it to false. I'm going to put a little group around here and we'll say drop prefab in the level. test this out so we can see again many many flaws in this design we will fix it as we go it's just a really solid starting point so notice how I'm moving around and watch how when I left click here again and I drop it I now have dropped the object in the scene so I can click bed again move another one drop that one click bed drop bed drop so Future, uh, future lessons, we need to, first of all, we shouldn't be able to put a bed on top of a bed on top of a bed on top of a bed. We should be able to t only drop a bed if it's safe to make sure that it's got a clearance and that they're not overlapping each other. Okay, that is it. That is it for a lesson one. Let's just do an overview again. On the button itself, we did a, we waited for input by creating two variables, one variable for the button and one variable for the object we're going to instantiate. So when we press the button, we go through, we instantiate the, the variable that's attached to this prefab called prefab to spawn. And then we store that in a new variable called current spawn prefab. This is a scene variable. You can see it at the top there. And then I create another variable called placing, and that's also a scene variable. And I set that to true. So that's all we did in the button. And then in the tiny room manager, we were waiting for the placing to be true. So once placing is true, basically when I click that button, we go through. And then it also does another check to see if the ray cast is over the specific area. In this case, if it's ray casting onto this red floor here. If it does, it fires off to the next one where it takes the current spawned prefab and moves it to follow the cursor. And then the last part, which is the dropping here, we, when we left click and we are currently placing, which is true, we turn the placing variable to false, which means all of this after this uh, branch stops working because I set it back to false. That means we drop the object into the world. And that is it for this lesson. This is part one, and we will keep making one part a week until we are done with this exercise. I hope you guys enjoyed it, but I will be making a C sharp one to go with the say of this, it's going to be basically be one to one in reference to this one, so that if you are interested in learning both, you can see how C sharp and Bolt are actually extremely similar because they're both based on uh, the C sharp. So thanks so much, guys. Have a great week.